have you been aware of the movement called Das Beben? Uh, I've only been aware of it since since working on this project with you because of uh, the link with um, Hugo Ayling and you know his his occurrence in your upcoming book so um, yeah. do you want me to just kind of like give everyone some background about like that'd at the start be, of our collaboration that would be very helpful thanks okay so well uh, uh, to be brief, you know, Rennie asked me to be involved in one of these Havruta projects, and I was a little bit at sea because it was sort of wide open. He, he essentially said you can collaborate with anyone you want, which is great, but sort of too much freedom for an artist. Um, and so I really, I, I, I did not have any ideas, but um, I've been uh, a reader of Peter's fiction for many, many years, actually since a teen. And at the time that Rennie was asking me about it, I happened to be reading a collection of stories, uh, American Fantastic Tales that Peter had er edited for the American Heritage Library, right? The, the Library of America. The Library of America. And um, I was reading his introduction, which I was quite struck by. It had some interesting things to say about fiction in general, as well as supernatural fiction. And I thought, well, maybe I could collaborate with Peter, although that seemed kind of a long shot, because Peter is a very successful author, and I didn't know how to get in touch with him. But uh, without going into the whole story of that, we actually managed to get in touch with each other. And so we started having a discussion about supernatural fiction, artwork, my past work, which I shared with Peter, a lot of which has to do with text and the textual description of images. And um, that began a conversation. And what really led to this specifically was that in having that discussion, Peter mentioned that in his upcoming novel, he was writing about a painting by a Victorian period English artist named Hugo Ayling, and this, this very odd painting that, that Ayling had produced that has sort of not been seen for many, many decades. And he sent me some passages where he described the painting, and I got really interested in that, and I was like, well, tell me more about this guy. And Peter himself only had legitimate information, so we kind of started researching this. And in researching Ailing's history, we discovered that he'd actually been part of a larger group, not, not a very large group, but a larger group, oh, yeah. that had a very sort of weird and disturbing history that stretched back throughout the 19th century and, and seemed to intersect with a lot of better known people. And we decided to just do a project based on that group, group which is Das Beben. Right, oh, that's a very good answer. Um... I, I, I was interested in Hugo Ayling um, because of the kind of sad, tragic uh, nature of his life in general and, and uh, the real splendor of some things he managed to create while still a young man. This guy, Ayling, was the son of a, of a bad, bad father who, who, who lost all his money really gambling on horses and, of course, on girls. And uh, Hugo's older brother got all the money that was left over. Hugo went to the Royal Academy of Art. Uh, he was expelled in his second year for decadence. I, and nobody's ever really explained that. Uh, now, of course, that, uh, so there were people who objected to that very, very strongly, thought he must be immoral. But there are other people who thought that made him sound really interesting. Um, Hugo was taken up. He, he, a Ailing had been, a a Ailing had worked in the studios of some famous Victorian painters, some like uh, L Lord, Lord Leighton, like Landseer, who, who painted very, very eloquent dogs. The v Victorians ate these paintings up. Um, the, the, pa the painter with whom we had the most s successful relationship was a guy named William Powell Frith. Uh, uh, Frith or Frith? Yeah, my it's Frith, I think. Frith. Oh, yeah, it's Frith because there's a Frith Street in, in, in Soho. Frith made huge, um, socially aware uh, paintings that involved a great many people of, of different orders and classes all doing different things. Uh, the, the one I know best is called Derby Day. There's a picture of another one out in the, uh, as part of the case, or below, what's that one called? Uh, I don't remember the exact title. It's it's essentially a, a view of a crowd at 
looking at paintings at the Royal Academy, yeah. at an exhibition at the Royal Academy That's in 1881. Great. So, and, and one of the people in it is actually, the, there's a number of noted people of the day, noted critics, but the one that we would all know is Oscar Wilde. Um, Frith loved Ailing's work. Uh, he discovered, uh, after a while, that when Ailing helped paint in the clouds and helped paint in the sky and the grass, that the painting was somehow much, much better than he could actually do on his own. So he, he, he cherished uh, this guy. And Ailing came to work for him every, every day a certain hour, and he left at a certain hour. On the weekends, he had a tendency to vanish, and he didn't know where he went. Eventually, he noticed that all throughout the week, but particularly on Mondays, Ailing came in to, uh, to paint in his, in his studio looking very, very ropey. So, sometimes he had bruises. Sometimes his hair was all askew. Some, some, so, sometimes he, uh, he showed traces of having been burned a little bit. His eyebrows were crisp, or he had uh, burn, burns on his hands and his arms. And he also showed signs of which Victorian people would have been as aware as we are of drug use. And um, laudanum was a drug very commonly used. Now, I'm not really sure that Hugo Ailing used laudanum or any other drug, but uh, he looked as though he did. Also, he had a kind of a strange relation with Frith's daughters. Um, Frith eventually fired him because he was too alarmed. Ailing, Ailing was working every weekend at a, uh, a, a country house in Kent called Blaine, that was owned by, uh, that had been owned by a family called, called the Haywards for years and years and years, uh, for decades. Um, they, you know, they go back to Magna Carta down there. Ailing had become part of, he had been subsumed in one of the Hayward family's great interests, which was, unfortunately, the occult. Um, Ailing was naturally designed, so to speak, to be interested, to be very interested in, in the occult, in the idea that the world could be transformed, that, there are, that there's a secret order to things, that what we see is false, and, and that uh, um, magical acts, ma magical words, magical deeds can, can evoke the, the, the reality that uh, un underlies what we see or can change that reality. Now, the Ailey's were all about all of that. They, they had um, invited the, the founding members of the Order of the Golden Dawn, a, a, a famous a, a cult organization that, um, us, that uh, Alistair Crowley eventually joined. Um, William Butler Yeats was a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn and, and wrote a lot of uh, great, great poems about, about their beliefs. And, and generally at that time in Victorian England, even though it was the Victorian period with all the things that we associate with the Victorian period, throughout England, in certain upper circles, and throughout Europe in general, there was a huge resurgence in the latter half of the 19th century in the occult. A tremendous amount. Tab table wrapping, ghosts, fairies down in the garden, uh, seances, weird figures. There was some woman who calls herself the gentle friend. I bet she was really creepy. Uh, you know, <laughs> she came and she said things to groups, and she was your gentle friend. Uh, and uh, for her friendship, presumably, one paid a hefty fee. Um, so the people at Blaine fit into this larger context, uh, and and the the fact that the context exists makes the Haywards' interest in the people who are there less strange. However, the Hayward family had been interested in that kind of thing for a long time. Queen Elizabeth had, a, had a, a, a court magician astrologer named John Dee, who's still a very famous uh, magician. He's in Dr. Strange and, and, and Mr. Morell, a, a, a novel we both uh, admire a lot by Audrey and, and in, uh, Niffenegger. Hmm? I mean, he's, he's referenced in a lot of He's fiction. referenced in a lot I mean, of he was, he was a real John person. Crowley. Yeah. John, um, John Crowley talks about him. He, he, he and his assistant uh, did very, very bizarre, arcane, uh, occult work in England. There was a time when they had to leave. They, they went to Europe. During that time, I gather, the Haywards invited them and offered them refuge, and they went from France to uh, Kent, uh, a, a, a village called Comfort Blandings, and uh, stayed in, in one of the 
outbuildings uh, of, of uh, Hay Hay Hayward Estate. Now, where things began to get dangerous was when the Haywards discovered that there were people who were leaving the Order of the Golden Dawn because they wanted something rougher, wilder, more dangerous, uh, and even more sacred. The, I don't think these people quite had a name. They, they didn't call themselves anything, but they themselves were very peculiar. These were people that were in the painting Hugo Ailing had been commissioned to do. It's interesting to think about this because the Hayward family uh, wanted a family portrait. And so the, here's the Hay Hayward family of the day standing in front of their massive country house. There's a picture of it out there. Uh, beautiful, aristocratic English people, you know, hair like manes, uh, faces like statues, uh, in in incredibly beautiful people. And off in the distance, there are the servants standing in a kind of a wedge with the butler whose name was, was actually Sodden, which is an old Kentish name. Um, uh, at, the, at, at, at the front, and uh, all, all, every single servant uh, that, that worked there, a huge number were all, you know, the undermaids and the dairy people and the gardeners, et cetera, um, all, all in this big tri triangle. And... There were still some people in the house because you can see one woman way, way up in, at a window. But on the other side of the entrance, kind of off to one side and, and sort of protected from view, there are these four very, very odd people. Uh, Olivia Shell, a man who called himself Lord Wren, and a very strange, angry, I think twisted little guy named Arnold Gather. These were the occultists that uh, were... in in residence at Blaine when Hugo Ailing came. They took one look at Hugo Ailing and devoured him. Uh, his painting changed. With all his gifts, he began to create a painting that really was unlike anything else that had been seen. So that's what I, I, I wanted to write about. I wanted to put in my book. It's a painting that is owned. It's actually owned by the Hayward family, uh, the, the American Haywards who, who live in Milwaukee. Uh, it was stolen from the Hayward estate by a very, very bad Hayward uh, and taken to America. Um, one of them let the uh, Milwaukee Museum of Art borrow it for a show in English landscape painting. It never left the museum because there was a huge dispute over ownership. And the, uh, uh, the, the court decided to let the painting stay uh, in, in the safety of the Milwaukee Museum in a, in a temperature-adjusted, light-sensitive vault. But it's not allowed to be shown. You can't see it. Uh, if you could see it, we, God knows. We don't knows. have images of it. Hmm? We don't have any images of it. No, we, we don't. You could, if you could open a little window here, I could show it to you beautifully. Um, it, it, it doesn't look the same, though, to, uh, to different people. Di different people see different things. Um, there's a woman named... Mar Margot Hayward, one of the uh, surviving uh, clan, American woman, who, who initially walked into that room and saw it. It was all in disturbing, kind of ill-making shades of yellow and green. And she wandered around. I mean, this is the part I put in my book. And, and she looked at all the paintings. Then she came back and looked at it and thought, no, it's not yellow and green. It's perfectly ordinary landscape colors. And then she looked at it some more and thought, no, it's different. There's something... So the, the, the painting itself has the qualities that caused William Powell Frith to fire Hugo Ailing and that uh, uh, led him to be part of this occult group in, in, in residence at the, at the country house called Blaine. And then the other part of the story is that th there's another trajectory that, that Ailing intersects, which is this this movement of artists, not, not specifically occultists, but, but Das Beben. And Das Beben is really sort of the, the product of this, this one person, um, this painter named Reinhold von Kreitz, whose history goes much further back. It goes back to the beginning of the, the 19th century. Um, and there's not a lot of information about that period, but we know that von Kreitz sort of traveled around Europe throughout like the 18th 30s, yeah. 1840s, he eventually shows up in Mannheim um, at an art academy there where he becomes a professor of painting. Um, 
he's a super controversial figure and he creates a lot of upheaval at the school. And when they don't, they didn't kick him out, no. but, but they, when the administration sort of came down on, that, on him, he just, he just up and left. He up and left and he moved, uh, he, he, he took up uh, rooms at, a, at a, a, a kind of a Rathskeller, a bar lodging house called Der, Die Blaue Gans or the Blue Goose. And it was from there that he conducted his very, very unusual classes in painting. Um, he'd been, he'd gone to Ma Mannheim, it's worth uh, re remarking, because Mannheim was a very orderly, precise, rational city. It was in Mannheim, believe it or not, that the bicycle had been invented. <laughs> and later the automobile. Yeah. Oh, I, was it really? The automobile? Yeah. Late, oh, there later was a Benz. Yeah, it Benz. There's a Benz. In, in, in the 1880s. In, how about that? So it, it's in this... Uh, an atmosphere of kind of mechanical and scientific thought that von Kreitz wanted to introduce all of this other way of thinking, this other way of living, because if von Kreitz believed in anything, it was contradiction. Uh, he, he saw contradiction as an essential force in the kind of art that he, he wanted to make, and he, he, he was very charismatic. We could talk about some of the stuff he used to teach, which is very, very uh, bizarre. In his, well, his he's, he's also someone that has, like the Haywards, and eventually von Kreitz and the Haywards intersect in England later, but von Kreitz is also sort of tied up in a lot of occult thinking, sort of alchemy, a, a, a weird mix of sort of early 19th century philosophy, but sort of weirder philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he had a lot of really odd notions about painting and what the role of painting in the visual arts uh, would be properly, which for him was to sort of depict this other layer of reality, um, sort of sort of true reality, because von Kreitz felt like the world that we see was sort of a fiction, an illusion. Um, and so when he when he was in Anheim, he sort of wound up pulling these disciples or alkalites together, these young painters who were at the uh, academy there, and that was that was essentially the first incarnation of this group, Das Beben. So these these five people kind of spending all their time at this, at this bar, yeah. um, painting their weird paintings and conducting their weird research. None of this work exists anymore because it was all destroyed in a fire. And yeah. so part, part of what we were trying to do is try to find references by critics of the time to some of this work and then try to reconstruct what it might have looked like visually. And the thing that's interesting is that all these descriptions that we have, which are pretty loose, seem to suggest that these that the work of these people had properties that much like Hugo Ayling's painting, uh, the paintings would sort of change based on people, the different who looked at them, when they looked at them. So things that we would not normally associate with what a painting might be able to do. Also the, um, the, the, the effect in other ways. Um, most painters when to work on a painting at least want people to kind of like it. Uh, that was not a very, where th this was not of a great deal of importance to the uh, artists of Das Beben. Das Beben, by the way, means the tremor. This is the, the name uh, von, von Kreitz gave his movement, and he, he, he held that, he held on to that name through every um, e incarnation. Um, even people in Das Beben sometimes didn't like each other's work, and it isn't based on the subject matter. The subject matter of painters uh, of Das Beben was sometimes, was almost always very, very conventional. Uh, fog, street scenes, landscapes, um, uh, sh shop windows, the contents of a shop. These are, these are paintings by von Kreitz. Um, it's not what's in them. It's, it's, it's not what the subject matter. It's not the content. The content is the way they are painted. And, and, and the effect that they produce. And the effect that they produce. Um, I, once I got interested in, in this uh, particular subject, I, I, I remembered um, a, a reference to Henry James, and I, um, I kind of uh, looked through all the books about James I have, and I finally found it a very obscure, in some ways discredited uh, biography of James that mentions that 
in the summer of 1888, in the fall of 1888, sorry, uh, at the time that Jack the Ripper was uh, rampaging through London and killing uh, uh, five w women. Now, I mean, at the time, that was a huge, unthinkable number. Now, of course, you barely count as a serial killer if you only kill five people. But uh, uh, he, was, he, he had this tremendous effect on London, 1888. Pe people were hysterical, especially people in the East End. James didn't like that at all. He was offended by it, and he thought it was trivia, but a kind of obscene tri trivia. To escape, he accepted an invitation on the part of Hoxton, H Hoxton H Holton Hayward. They, they, their first names all begin with H. H Holton Hayward to visit him at Blaine. So little knowing what he was getting into, I saw in this biography, James took a train uh, from uh, Paddington Station to Comfort Blatt, Blanton Station, and w was led up to the, the, the country house, where much to his horror, eventually he met these three um, very, very odd, uh, colorful, and yet uh, unspeakable and, and offensive people gather, uh, the woman, uh, Olivia Schell, and, and Lord Wren. Um, he also seems to have been involved in a hunting accident that there's like, do you remember when Dick Cheney shot a friend of his in a grouse hunting thing in Texas? He, he somehow, <laughs> he, he, he moved his shotgun so that it faced this uh, very rich uh, Republican pal of his, and he just blasted him. Um, the, guy, the guy was far enough away so that he was just peppered. Uh, well, the same thing ha happened to Henry James, who was very, very unhappy about it and had to be led back to the house. And I think he, he was given laudanum at that time. And uh, he didn't understand what was happening to him. He didn't, and it's best not to inquire too carefully. I think you know what Henry James thought ha ha happened to him. But um, that was another thread that l led me into the uh, strange events of Blaine. And Blaine led me uh, inevitably to Reinhold von Kreitz, who was haunted by conflagrations. Uh, he, at the moment, ev everything was boiling in the, in the blue goose, and he was giving fantastic lectures to which really the scum of society in Mannheim also came very, very faithfully. P prostitutes and pickpockets and layabouts and bums, they all loved what von Kreitz was saying. <laughs> and one night there was a terrible fire, and von, von Kreitz survived. He was, he was marked by the fire. He was never the same after. Uh, if and you've all, the ever, other, all the other guys died. All the other guys died, except uh, one of his uh, most faithful uh, disciples, um, a, a young man named, von, uh, named Kloppenberg, Kloppenberg should have died probably because and he was. He, he died a few years later. Yeah, anyway. he was so he his ears had melted, and uh, he was cared for by his family. But uh, it must have been an awful, painful uh, existence for a little while. He died. Von Von Kreitz was mutilated by the fire, and his voice was sounded sound like the voice of Miles Davis in uh, Miles's last uh, three decades. Anybody know what that sounded like? Alfred, can you give me another beer? It's a question or, asked by Miles Davis. Or like, the, the, uh, or like the Emperor in the Star Wars movies. Yeah, right. <laughs> Anyhow, um, also he was uh, kind of bent over. His uh, chest was scarred by fire. and he, his, uh, One imagines his face was too. Anyhow, this fire was a disaster. Von Kreitz left, and he traveled to Lubeck. Eventually, he traveled, he, he took a long time to get there. Um, and. Tony and I couldn't find out what he yeah, did. Yeah, he kind of he kind of vanishes, really. Like, yeah, you know, and all this is like we're getting all this information from journals, occasional newspaper articles from the time period. So a lot of this we're kind of having to ex extrapolate a bit about mm -hmm. where this guy is and what he's doing. But there's no trace of him for almost ten years, and then. Then he's on this weird island in the Baltic for a long time, yeah. and then he disappears again. And then he turns up eventually in England, where he winds up intersecting the Haywards. 
He meets he meets the occultists in a strange bookstore called the Tr Trismegistus, which I learned from a, 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 a young German painter whose who's, uh, who's, uh, diary I read um, was known as the Triz. Uh, he, he haunted the Triz. It was one of a series of a, a small, cranky occult bookstores run by small, cranky occult men who, um, that, that, that was located in the area of the B British Museum. If you go to the British Museum now and just tilt off on the side street, you'll probably find a couple of these bookstores. When, when I lived in London in the 70s, there were four or five of them. And uh, they were creaky, upstairs, odd places. Way more, way stranger than the kind of versions of them you see in movies. They, 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 they were not comfortable of being, but they were welcoming and comfortable to people whose interests aligned exactly with, with the, those of the bookstore. Um, so, so Von Kreitz the, met our, our, our group there. So one of the things that was interesting to us was that these, these people, this group, through these two different manifestations, their history is almost completely wiped out. I mean, there's a first fire in Mannheim, there's a second fire in England, so like all their work is destroyed, except for this one painting by Ailing. Mm -hmm. And there's no real mention of them in any kind of mainstream history of the 19th century. So in some ways, it's almost like they never existed. But at the same time, what is curious to us, like uh, Peter is talking about with Henry James, is that they keep intersecting better known people. And they seem to have had some kind of indirect influence on a lot of these people, uh, or at least the work did. So the, the people who saw this work, um, the French painter Odilon Redon, intersected von Kreitz when he was living on this island in the Baltic, and that seems to have influenced some of Redon's paintings, his later paintings, which as some of you know, get a lot weirder and darker than they were prior to his time when he was a soldier. Um, so lots of things like that. So it's almost as though this group, which is invisible and sort of erased from history, has this weird echoing presence. And for me, yeah. as, as, a, as a visual artist who works with text and sort of descriptions of works that are often withheld or imaginary, that was super interesting to me because it seemed like an opportunity to kind of play that same game that I play in my own work, but with historical figures. Mm -hmm. It's very appealing to think of something that's both there and not there at the, at, at the same time. And this is preeminently the case with the artists of Das Baben and with von, von uh, Kreitz. He, um, he, he died in, 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 in the second fire. And I think we might almost be glad because von, von, von Kreitz was trying to affect uh, a real transformation. Uh, we, ha we haven't gone into his methods and his techniques, but they were very almost rigid. They were very uh, proscriptive. You had to grind your paints, you had to make your paints in a certain way from certain specific objects. One, one pigment was made from crushing the skulls of South, Af I mean the skeleton, the, the shells of South African beetles. Uh, and if you were uh, w one of Von Kreitz's students, it might be your job for two or three weeks to grind up these, these uh, disgusting bug shells. Uh, other, that's, that's uh, he used the, uh, he used the bones the bones of some bird. What was that bird? Swallows, S starlings. S swallows or starlings? Swallow I get them confused. He, um, <laughs> I'm not a bird. Sw bird. Swallows, I think. Swallows. Let's hope. Anyhow. Um, you, he, he treated those bones in, in a certain way to, to achieve a certain color that he knew he could get by using them. There's he, something like very alchemical about it that I'm yeah. just like, if, if any of you know about like Rudolf Steiner and um, his sort of weird preparations for soil that uh, are used even now in like biodynamic farming, it was a little bit like that where things had to be sort of left out overnight under like a full moon or a waning moon. It, yeah. it's, it, it's weird. Weirdness is the hallmark. Uh, he used to, um, from from the uh, uh, records of one young painter, we, we know that sometimes he, he had a big uh, oaken stick that he used to bang on the floor rhythmically in time with mathematical equations that he was he was chanting. 
and he wanted his students to memorize these mathematical equations. And in fact, math had a huge uh, uh, a part in the in, in the in, in the work he was doing. One of his uh, p pupils, you know, re remember wrote wrote this odd thing about. Shapes, colors, right. lines. It's, it's it's slick or slicky. How do you, how do you pronounce Lutz it? Slicky. Luch slicky. Um, who was really interested in like weird spatial geometry? Um, yeah. His mother was an amateur mathematician, and so there's this implication almost, and this sounds sort of fantastical, that you know there were operations that went into making these paintings and the elements of these paintings that would actually almost have some sort of like magical effect on things, or at least that's what they thought. So there were famous uh, art critics, painters, poets, uh, such as Heine, who said, no matter what you say, paint can't move. These people are not making paintings that seem to move as you watch them. But the fact that he took that position so strongly indicates that there were a lot of people who said that they did. And uh, there, uh, you have to have a sort of courage to claim that when you stood in front of a certain painting, you saw a person in it move, or you saw the grass move uh, through the wind, or you saw awnings flutter in a, in a breeze from, uh, from the sea. Um, all, these, all these effects are attributed to paintings by, by people whose work we found. Um, the, the other thing we found is that these paintings, uh, all of different, uh, often very banal subjects, made some of the, of the audience feel ill, feel oppressed, feel threatened. There was an older woman who was a guest at Blaine and uh, s spent a little time looking at one, one of these paintings. Of Heathman's. He Heathman's painting. Yeah. And, and thought, this painting wants to do something. This painting has a very, very bad thing on its mind. I don't want this painting ever to do anything but stay on that wall. 